and openness and receptivity. I want to begin to by define a few terms. Christmas, Christmas, Christ mass, the birth of a Christ awareness. Christ is a divine idea. It is a divine idea of the perfect human being, the divine essence of you, of me. Jesus, not as our great exception, but as our great example. And so what is being born is every moment, every thought, every feeling that we have, not just in December, but all year long, is the birth of our divine nature. The attributes of a Christ being that Jesus emulated, but was not the only one and only Christ being. What does it look like? It looks like peace. It looks like harmony. It looks like joy. It looks like the compassion and kindness that we saw demonstrated with our children. We have the possibility today for that energy to be born through us, for that energy to be born in our minds and in our hearts. Are you willing to take that adventure? Try to contain your excitement. The reality is we are on the precipice of something beautiful about to happen. The thought that you're holding right now is a beautiful manger for a possibility, a stable. Is there room in the inn between your ears for something great to happen here today in this now moment? I'm saying today, let it be love. Let it be love so profound, so full, so rich, so amazing that you will not be the same person that walked into this room when you walk out because you have allowed yourself to be the birth of something magnificent. And I don't care what name you call it. Christ is the one that unity likes to use. You can call it the Buddha nature. You can call it the Atman. You can call it the Tao. You can call it Fred. But call it forth. Call it out. Let it be no matter what is out here in the external world. Here's the quote I would like to use. I don't know who this woman was. I didn't have time to find out, but I just love what she had to say. Her name is uh, Marie Louise von Franz. And I'm going to invite you to read this with me right now. Together, if we can stay with the tension of opposites long enough, sustain it, be true to it, we can sometimes become vessels within which the divine opposites come together and give birth to a new reality. There's a lot of juice in there. But have you noticed, as I have noticed, that the world appears to be in a lot of tension these days? First service was like, no, no, I'm, I'm fine, I'm good. I guess I was the only one, so I found my people. The world and the human race as we know it today seems to be a little bit tense. There's tension in the air, and I'm not calling that tension bad. I'm taking that quote and saying the tension that we are feeling means that birthing is about to happen. If we can sit in the fire, if we can sit in the crucible and the container of what is up in the human condition, love can and will be born. Yes? Do you believe that? How often do we believe that? 24-7? I don't know about you, but I go to sleep all week long. It's like it's tense, and it, it doesn't feel good, and I want to run from it, or I want to fight it. Perhaps we can stand in the middle of a rubber band that's stretched and to know that I am the very vessel and portal through which something good can happen. The stress balls I handed out, whoever's got them, give them a squeeze. Because the more tense life gets, the more you can hold on to that power of love and squeeze a little bit more love out of you. Just when you think you've tapped into the deepest parts of the love that you have to offer, something happens, life happens, and you give a little squeeze to the stress ball. Oh my gosh, there's more of me to reveal. There's more of me to know. There's more of me to express. The Christ is being born. The Buddha is being born in this moment because I did not give the power to what was out here and to the tension, but to that which the tension is pulling forth to rise to the surface. Anybody know the book Tuesdays with Maury? Yeah. I love that book, and it's also an equally great movie. I want to read a, uh, a scene from that book that talks about this tension. Have I told you about the tension of opposites, Maury said? Life is a series of pulls back and forth. You want to do one thing, but you are bound to do another. Something hurts you, yet you know it shouldn't hurt you. You take certain things for granted, even when you know you should never take anything for granted. A tension of opposites, like the pull of a rubber band. And most of us live somewhere in the middle. Buddha said the middle way is the way to be. Don't let yourself go too far one side or the direction, but to stand in the middle, the crucible, the rubber band, and vibrate 
vibrate that something is about to break loose. It sounds like a wrestling match, I say. He laughs. Yes, you could describe life that way. So which side wins, I ask. Maury smiles at me, his crinkled eyes and his crooked teeth. Love wins. Love always wins. How many of you love to be on the winning side? I, I don't know about you, but I really like to win. I'm a bit of a, that's the people that play pickleball with me. I am a bit of a competitor. <laughs> I really don't like losing. Ask my wife when we sit down and play canasta together at a card table. And believe me, that's a vicious match. Some of the words that are shared across the table, my wife actually says, damn you more than anything else. I love to win, and I don't like to lose. The world is involved in a lot of competition right now. I love to win with an election. I love to pick the candidate that won the election. I love to win there. I love to win in court, and I spent a little bit of time in court. No worries, my record is clear. I love to win in court. I love to win in an argument. Let me tell you, the world is rampant with arguments right now, and I have participated in those arguments, and it feels so good when I am right, <laughs> when I am justified. The reality is the person left the same argument saying that I was the winner, and he was the loser. Our human world is contextualized. When we contextualize the idea of winner from a human egotistical standpoint, what does that mean? A stretch of opposites. If I am the winner, there must be a loser. Always. That doesn't feel so good. At any given moment, you're going to be on one side of that equation or the other. Perhaps there's a different definition, a different vibration of what it means to be a winner. Perhaps it is all about in the midst of the competition, in the midst of the argument, in the midst of the debate, in the midst of the pickleball court and the card table to be the presence of love with the person in front of you and to be able to walk away still friends. I believe that the human race needs to pay attention to this very, very simple idea. Is it possible that when love meets love in a competitive environment that love can win and that nobody has to be a loser no matter what the score is, no matter what the election is? No matter whether I leave 11 to 0 or a 0 to 11 on the pickleball court that we can leave as love. I'm seeing it proved at a very microcosmic level. Pickleball court, card table. I'm still married, although there were moments where I, that was questioned at the card table. At that level, it's one thing. But can we take that truth and bring it to a deeper level? That's what this holiday is about. In the midst of the tension that we are feeling, I give more love. Whether my arm is raised or my head is bowed in a place of quote unquote defeat. I want to carry the tension of opposites into the extreme. This is the true confession portion of the day. I am a minister of peace. I am a minister of love. I am a pacifist at heart. Yet I really, really, really enjoy mixed martial arts. Oh my gosh, don't leave. There was a groan. My wife is the one that groans because she doesn't get it. I love the sport. I love the competition of mixed martial arts, a couple of men or a couple of women getting into an octagon, a crucible, if you will, by choice to do battle. Karate? <laughs> Who said, get some? <laughs> you look pretty tough. I'm not going to get in the ring with you. <laughs> the reality is karate, jujitsu, wrestling, a wrestling match where there is tension, where you are going into the ring by your own design to be in a competitive environment where somebody's hand will be raised and somebody's head will be bowed. Let me tell you what I see more times than not. Not all competitors do this. At the end of three rounds, somebody's won and somebody has lost by the ego's definition. And I see two guys or two women come across the ring and embrace each other as if they were brother or sister. Isn't that interesting? This very brutal and sometimes what could be considered violent act of mixed martial arts. They come up and they say, man, that was a great go around, wasn't it? Whew, what a match. We really entertained these folks. And you can see smiles on their face. 
And almost as if they're saying, okay, let's do this again next week because it felt so good to be engaged in that competition. Competition is not bad. It's a good thing unless it is coming from the ego place where I need to dominate you. I need to be the winner and you need to be the loser or vice versa. They come together as friends and say, let's do this again. There's a lot of mixed martial arts going on in our human condition today. It doesn't look like getting into an octagon, but it looks like an emotional warfare. It looks like a mental warfare. It looks like political warfare. It looks like I just have to, in my dialogue with you, convince you that I am right and you are wrong so that we have a winner and a loser. And I'm saying that dichotomy set up by the human ego is tearing the fabric of the world down. We need a lot more kindness in the midst of our competition. We need a lot more compassion. We need a lot more love in the midst of the tension and the stress that is right here in front of us. You're going to have things that feel like mixed martial arts when you come up against somebody who thinks totally different than you. There are competing ideas everywhere. I'm calling that good because that means there is a possibility in the midst of the tension, the competing ideas, for something greater to be born. But what is the mindset that you bring to the table? I have two uh, uh, spiritual, political MMA artists in the room that I spend time with on Wednesday mornings, Chet Bertoli and Peter Breeze. They are fierce competitors. Sometimes I just back away from the ring. And guess what? They are the best of friends. They have proven a principle that in the midst of the tension, and they don't think the same about anything. But what they don't do is hold a religious tension that says, my God can beat up your God. My candidate can beat up your candidate. I think this way, you think this way, and there's a lot of us going around the planet in an octagon, a crucible of being that say, my idea can beat up your idea. We have returned to junior high, middle school behavior. And I'm calling myself out. Just so you know, I'm calling myself on that. I need to graduate to a higher level. Remember middle school? My dad can beat up your dad. I love the song by Michael Byers who said, he sang, my dad can beat up your dad but he wouldn't. My dad can beat up your dad, but he wouldn't even try. I believe the future of the human race depends on our ability to be the presence of love, to see the presence of love, to do battle of wits, battle of ideas, to argue and to be together in the crucible and go, what are we doing for lunch tomorrow? Let's go have a cigar. Because you are my friend. And I'm not defined by the competition, I'm defined by something deeper. The mixed martial artists that hug each other do not define themselves by the ring, but they define themselves by the love and the thrill of the competition and the banter. Is it possible that you could emulate Chet the Christ and Peter the Christ? And it's funny that you sit on opposite sides of the room. <laughs> I noticed that Peter's on the right and Chet is on the left. <laughs> But the reality, is that possible? I'm saying, yes, it is possible and it is inevitable if we practice the principles that we teach. There are some people that have come to me recently and been a bit critical that I've gotten a little tense. And I have been tense because this is a relevant church that if it's in the field of the world, it must be in the field here to talk about. And sometimes it comes across like my passion is a little bit angry. I'm not angry. I'm just ready. I'm ready for the midst of the tension to be released so that the light can be born, that the good can be born. And in order for that to happen, we have to remember who we are and that the competition is not for I win and you lose. It is to bring a greater sense of wholeness. This is what the Buddha has to say about love as the vehicle for wholeness. Go ahead and put the next quote up there. Let's read this together. Love is a gift of one's innermost soul to another so both can be Whole. Could it be, just open a corner of your mind today, that the exchange of ideas is about bringing us both into a greater awareness, that I can learn from you and you can learn from me and there will be a greater wholeness that emerges from the tension itself. Mixed martial artists seem to understand that, that this round that we just had that was so intense, I'm now a better wrestler and you're a better wrestler. And it doesn't really matter if your hand was raised, you're going to get a bigger paycheck than me.
What matters is that I am better than I was before the wrestling. That's the mindset of the Buddha. That's the mindset of the Christ. That is the mindset of one who says, I'm not about the competition. I'm about the growth. We need to be about the growth and to know that we're both, all of us, going to a place of wholeness. We're coming home. We're making our way home. And love is the only path that's going to get you there. Go ahead. I'll take it. No matter the holiday season that you celebrate, and there's like 37 holidays that are celebrated in December. I don't care which one you celebrate. We happen to have a Christmas tree that represents Kwanzaa. It represents Spirawanza, which is my version of Kwanzaa. It represents Hanukkah. It represents the Buddha's birthday. It represents the birthday that's happening today as you allow the tension to birth something into reality. I don't care which one you practice. It's about letting love have its way in the midst of the human condition. Jesus, like every other prophet and sage and teacher throughout history, was born at a divine appointment. A divine appointment. And my Baha'i friends, here's where I get into a little argument. They say that every thousand years, another prophet is born into the planet to wake the planet up. I say, gosh, that's kind of a limited focus from my standpoint. I don't want to wait a thousand years for the waking up process. I don't want to wait two more weeks for the Christ to be born on Christmas Day. I believe that everybody sitting in this room was the right person at the right time in the right place to be the light of the world. Why are you waiting around for somebody else to take that responsibility? You were born in, you were born in and as through around the presence of love itself. And so your job is to sit at the card table, to sit on the pickleball court, to sit in the debate over lunch, to sit in the tension of the human environment and be the veritable presence of love. Go ahead and compete. Tussle and wrestle with each other. That's fun. Enjoy the game and then jump out of the octagon and go, what are we having for lunch tomorrow because I still love you. Today, my hand was raised. Tomorrow, your hand will be raised. But that doesn't really matter. I don't care what the score was of the game. We did something together, and we're all a little bit better. You see, we have forgotten who we are. Jesus was there to remind us who we are. Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad, all the prophets, many that don't get titles as religious leaders but are Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, Nelson Mandela. They were the right person at the right time to say there's a different way. Or we're going to argue ideas. We are going to argue ideas a lot. And sometimes I'm going to win, and sometimes I'm going to lose. Jesus lost. Jesus won. Martin Luther King Jr. won, and Martin Luther King Jr. lost. It was not about the win or the lose. We're running a marathon. Love is a marathon, and it is not for the faint of heart that want to run a 50-yard dash. Well, I tried loving that person once. I gave them love, and it didn't come back to me. Oh, you must become like a child who answered before before I even got the message out, I got love by giving love. And there was more love available to the entire platform of children here because one heart was given away. That's a marathon. We're changing a boat. You know, to turn a boat around in the ocean, a big old giant boat, it takes miles to turn that thing around and go the other direction. Are you willing, do you have the stamina of love and strength in partnership, two of the 12 powers that are necessary to turn the boat around? 2020 is, is ripe with possibility. The tension going into 2020, oh, it's, that rubber band is pulled tight. And I will not shy away from the difficult dialogues. I will do my best to temper my delivery. But the reality is some people have been a little frustrated with something that I will not budge on. If what we do in this room stays in this room, it's been a mild entertainment. It's been good to a degree, but we must take what is in this room. I love you. I love you. I love you. must go out there, and I must show it at the restaurant table. I must show it at the counter. I must show it at the family gathering. I must show it when we are talking about political ideas. I must show it when you and I just don't see together, don't see the same, it must be because the entire human race depends on it. 
Everyone's waiting around for a Messiah to come. Guess what? The Messiah came and he's sitting in your seat. She is sitting in your seat. Quit shirking that responsibility. And remember who you are. You were born perfect, whole, and complete, just like these children. That reminded me of a story. My, my uh, friend, Reverend Fred Williamson, up in Portland, Oregon, he tells this story, and I think it's important to remember that. He was being introduced as a guest speaker at a church, and the guy introducing him was a little bit nervous. He was his first time to be the platform assistant. And he, he goes to the platform and he says, good, good morning, everybody. We are uh, delighted to have a, a, our guest speaker here today, uh, Reverend Fred Williamson. And, and Reverend Fred is, has brought his fam family here today. He's brought his beloved and wonderful wife, Dorothy. <laughs> and Dorothy and Fred have brought their two beloved children with them today. Their daughter, Mary, and their wonderful son, Robert. For over 50 years, Reverend Fred Williamson has been in service to our Lord and our Savior, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Here's a reality. We're all looking to an old card for the answers to that which we know innately. You were born in love, yet we're living by what somebody told you, what somebody demonstrated, what somebody says. You have to be the winner, and you have to be the loser. That's an old tape. It's an old paradigm. It's an old card. Throw it out. It does not belong in the octagon. And we think, oh, we're kind people. I'm a kind person. But, but somebody said it first service, and it really hit home that if I'm in a dialogue with you and you have to change your mind for me to be comfortable, I am engaged in an MMA battle. If you have to change your mind and have a different idea for this to be a good dialogue, I'm in a fight and I have forgotten who I am and I'm looking to a card to define the light of my being. It's time to get rid of the card. There's a, a tribe, many tribes that do this, but they're all around the world, communities that do this. Somebody in the tribe screws up. Somebody messes up and somebody breaks the rules. And rather than discarding that person, throwing them away, they bring them to the center of the village and they put them right in the center. And the entire tribe gathers around. Now you'd think to shame them. You're the loser. You're bad. You're wrong. No, it's just the opposite. Let me remind you of all the goodness that you are. All the good things that you have done. All the ways that you have blessed my life. That is a simple shift in perspective that I believe there's no very little crime in these particular communities. Now that's a very small microcosm. But I believe it is a wonderful model. If we, we and our arguments can sit and remind you that you are the light of the world, we don't see eye to eye at all, and we're going to tussle a little bit, and we're going to wrestle, and it's going to feel really tense, but I will not give up. I will be a pit bull with the bone of your magnificence. Because you're not defined by the game we're about to have. You are defined by something more beautiful, more powerful, more true, and more profound. It is absolute in its nature. An absolute oneness with God and all creatures and all creation. No matter what you think or how you live, feel that. You want Christmas to be born? You want Kwanzaa to happen? Unity, one of the principles of Kwanzaa. For Pete's sake, we've got to start living it. I have to start living it. Don't make this a preaching me at, me at you. I'm preaching to myself. I'm preaching to the part of myself that still holds on to, I have to win, and you have to lose. And then everything will be just fine, because you're thinking the way I think. Let me tell you, if we all in this room think exactly the same, you're all unnecessary. If we all think the same, you're all unnecessary. And that's not what we teach. You are necessary. You are worthy. You are valuable. You are magnificent. Don't play small. Play the game 
and then leave the octagon behind and become the veritable presence of the Christ. Jesus, Jesus, Buddha, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, they told us in one form or another, love your enemies. Get into the ring and love your enemies. I'm going to carry that a heck of a lot further. But my apologies with all due respect to Jesus. He didn't go far enough. You have no enemy. Nothing and no one is against you. Peter and Chet, Peter and Chet, never once have insulted or name-called or thought the other one was ignorant, but enjoyed the competition of being together and letting divine ideas have their way so that the tension births something great. And they tell each other over and over and over again, I love you, brother. You're amazing. You're a kook. You're crazy. You don't make any sense to me, but I love you. And I will never give, give up the view of who each and every one of you is. It's easy to tell children, isn't it? Children come up, oh, I see the face of God. I behold the light of the world. You need to get up in the mirror and see it. And then you need to sit at the table in an argument, in a debate, regardless of who won the election. I have seen, you know, I want to clearly state here, and I'm going to just get vulnerable and maybe a little teary. This isn't just a theory for me. And I get passionate about it because my job has afforded me the opportunity to see families destroyed over a football game. That's silly. We can laugh about that. I have seen communities destroyed over political dialogue. Wow, not so funny anymore. I have seen relationships destroyed, friendships lost over a petty little argument. Don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff. The argument is the small stuff. Yet we have turned our attention to being right and to being a victor. I need to convince you that you're wrong so that I will be the victor and feel good about myself. That is ego-driven relationship. And the time is to quit looking at that card, put it down, and have a new card. Jesus, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, they also said in one form or another, lay down your swords. Let love lead. Now, it's important to recognize that these people, these great heroes, they suffered. There's pain involved in this process. And you're running a marathon somewhere, not that I know firsthand, but I've heard somewhere around mile 20, something hurts. And you find and dig deeper into something that helps you get to mile 26. I'm saying we're probably at about mile 20 right now. And the tension of what is happening in the human race is calling for us to push through the pain, to dig deeper, and to find something more profound and something more beautiful. Now, your ego is going to fight that. They're going to walk over me. Come on, let's be honest with each other. We say that. Oh, if I play love and they're not playing love, then they're gonna, you're going to destroy me. I will be the loser. I'm saying you've opened up a field for love to come from a thousand different directions, and love is the most powerful power on the planet. Love them anyway, because love is going to rush in and transform that which is in the midst of the tension. You know, as a congregant here, and I'm going to close with this story, I won't mention her name, but she was a, a model to me of what it means to be the light. She's been involved in a court case for many, many, many months. And she came to me with looking for counsel, looking for help. She was scared. She was afraid. She didn't know what was going to happen. And I said, you only have one job. And this is counterintuitive because a lawyer might tell you, go in and let's fight. You're going to use a greater tool than the sword here. I said, you walk into the court and you're going to see behind the bench the face of love. You're going to see on either side, either table, the face of love. And you're going to know yourself as the face of love. And she walked into that courtroom the first time, and nothing went the way it was supposed to go. And she came back to me for counsel. I did what you asked me to do. I said, okay, when's the next court date? Go do it 
again. She went, well, I actually it got postponed. I think not one, not two, not three times. And then there were people involved. I don't know who all those people are between you and the judge, but there were a lot of people involved here that were not telling her what she wanted to hear. And I said, you have one job, see the face of love, be the face of love, and know that love will win the marathon. Love will win. And it got more tense and more tense and more tense. Some of you were sitting in a very tense courtroom, a very tense octagon, a very tense environment. Last month, this woman came to me and said, everything, everything worked out just exactly the way I would have designed it. And I'm so grateful that I did not give up being the vibrating center of love when my ego wanted to fight and I wanted to attack and I wanted to tear down and I wanted to run away and I wanted to do battle. Love always, always wins. Breathe that in. There's thoughts going in your head right now with a situation that you are dealing with in your life today. Oh, yeah, well, that worked great for her, but oh, you have no idea how painful it is where I'm at. You have no idea how rude these people are. Let me tell you, they can't be probably as rude as my wife sitting across the canasta table. <laughs> and certainly not as rude as Al Mango on the pickleball court. <laughs> certainly not as rude as what, what uh, can happen in the midst of the arguments that I've seen facing the planet today. You're going to be torn down. You're going to be ridiculed. You are going to be disappointed, and you are going to be critiqued, and yes, you will be crucified. You will win, you will lose, you will struggle, you will fail, and you will suffer sometimes, and you're going to feel a great deal of tension. Can that tension be the birth of a great mountain, or a great pearl, or the refinement of the gold of your very being? You get to decide. Nobody can decide for you. I'm deciding for myself. But I want to bring you on that ride and squeeze just a little bit more love out of yourself because you will not be the same on the other side. This woman who had this court case, her eyes look different. Her face looks different. Everything in her life, and she came to me just today. And she said, I have got to talk to you. I've got to share something because something beautiful is happening and I'm ready to burst out. That's not because of anything I said or did or anything anybody did in the court case, but as a result of her willingness to stay true to the marathon, to the love. The greatest moments of history were born at the end of a rope called love. Let's hang on to that rope where you are right now. People were exhausted and frustrated and in pain. Let's hold on to that rope and know that love always finds a way. Love makes a way out of no way. There is only, only love. Take a moment to breathe that with me as we prepare to go into meditation. Breathing in love, breathing out anything that is unlike love. Knowing that in this competition, I want you to bring a competitor into the meditation today. I want you to bring, not an adversary, but the person you've called the enemy and to release completely the card that you were looking at that says, this is my enemy. It's no longer needed. Bring into your meditation the presence and the face of God. And when we sing, may all beings know love, this beautiful Buddhist prayer, send it to that person that is no longer your enemy. 